أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد أرسلنا رسلنا بالبينات وأنزلنا معهم الكتاب والميزان ليقوم الناس بالقسط صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى والصلاه والسلام على عباده الذين استفى خصوصا على افضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الامين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى كما ورد في سوره النساء اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الله يامركم ان تؤدوا الامانات الى اهلها واذا حكمتم بين الناس ان تحكموا بالعدل ان الله نعم ما يعظكم به ان الله كان سميعا بصيرا يا ايها الذين امنوا اطيعوا الله واطيعوا الرسول واولي الامر منكم فإن تنازعتم في شيء فردوه إلى الله والرسول إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر ذلك خير وأحسن تأويلا صدق الله العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ربنا ألهمنا رشدنا وعزنا من شرور أنفسنا اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم ارحمنا بالقران العظيم واجعله لنا اماما ونورا وهدى ورحمه اللهم ذكرنا منه ما نسينا وعلمنا منه ما جهلنا وارزقنا تلاوته انا الليل واطراف النهار واجعله لنا حجه يا رب العالمين امين Dear brothers and sisters and sons and daughters in Islam assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh As you must be remembering we completed the translation and brief study of the first 57 ayat of surah an-nisa last night Now we are proceeding further the two ayat which I have just recited our most profound ayat of the quran regarding the fundamental principles of islamic state just as we read two ayat ayat number 32 and 34 they were most profound regarding the institution of family ayat number 34 says ar ridalu qawwamun ala an-nisa bima faddala allah ba'dahum ala ba'din وبما انفقوا من اموالهم فالصالحات قانتات حافظات للغيب بما حفظ الله الى اخر الايه so in the same way these two ayat are very basic very fundamental regarding the structure of islamic state and in these two ayat we find that all the three pillars or the basic institutions they have been mentioned of an islamic state although the terminology used here is not of the modern political science these are general terms general words but if you analyze the ayat you find that all the three pillars of a state you know in a modern state we have three basic institutions basic pillars legislature on the one side executive on the other side and then the judiciary so you will find that these all three of these are being mentioned here and let me explain in the beginning the political system of islam is that of caliphate the first basic principle is that sovereignty belongs to allah not to any human being as individual 
or not to the nation or humanity at large collectively. Sarvari zeba fakat us zate be ham taako hai hukmara hai ik wohi baaki mutane azri. In il hukm illa Allah. Sovereignty belongs to Him. Now, if sovereignty belongs to Allah, what remains for the humans? That is called khilafa. Why hear and see? What is it? Whatever commands are coming from the real sovereign, you have to implement as such. You can't alter. You can't change them. Not even 100% of you can, do, can, can make any change in it. What to speak of 51%, majority or minority, absolutely irrelevant. What command is coming from Allah? is to be implemented as such. Where there is no specific instructions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is amrukum. Now Allah has given this, this sphere to you. Wa amruhum shura bainahum. Here you can have mutual consultation. Decide the matters. But till that time that the institution of Nabuwa, institution of prophethood was continuing, the Khilafa used to be personal and individual. The Nabi was the caliph in his own person. That is why we find in the Quran, Hazrat Dawood alayhi salam was addressed, Ya Dawoodo, inna jalna ka khalifatan filawd. Here the pronoun is singular. O Dawood, we have declared you to be the caliph on earth. Inna jalna ka khalifatan filawd. Because it's very logical. Allah is sovereign and this person, this human being, he is Nabi, he is Prophet. He has a direct communication with the real Sovereign. The commands of Allah are coming to him. So he has to implement them. So he is the Caliph in his own individual person. That is why singular pronoun used, Ya Dawood Jalna Inna Jalna Ka Khalita Fanfil Arq. And this continued. Till such time that the institution of Caliphate was, the institution of Nabuwa, Prophethood was continuing, this was the condition. That is why we find in, in the hadith, the Sahih of Bukhari, Rahimahullah, Kanat Manu Israel Tasusahumul Ambiya, Kullama Halaka Nabiyun, Khalafahu Nabiyun. The community matters, the political affairs of Bani Israel were in the hands of the prophets. Whenever a prophet died, another prophet was in his place. Just as we know, Hazrat Dawood died, he was the Caliph. And he was the Prophet, and after him, Hazrat Sulaiman, alayhi salatu was salam, he is the, he is the Caliph, and he is the Prophet. But now, when this institution of Prophethood has come to an end in the person of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, now things are changed. This Caliphate is now collective for the Ummah. That is why now we find in Surah Al Nur that the plural pronoun is used. وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ It is not Ka now, it is not one person. لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ This Khilafat is now has become a collective affair of the Muslim Ummah as a whole. So these are the basic principles. And then, you know, they are the institutions. There must be somebody who has to look after the affairs of the state. You may call him the head of the state, you may call him anything. You may call him caliph, but there should be an executive machinery to manage the affairs of the state. Then you know, ijtihad is to be continuously made. Legislation, this process will continue. New problems will arise, and we shall have to solve them. So there has to be a legislature also. Then there has to be a judiciary also. So all these three basic principles and basic ingredients of a state, modern state, we can say, that they are potentially present and mentioned in these two ayat. Inna Allah ya murukum man tuaddul amanat ila ahlihaf. The first instruction. Verily, O Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordains upon you that you hand over the trust to those to whom it belongs or to those who are worthy. Now, what is the trust? When you are a community, you have to elect or select or somehow. You must have some caliph, some head of the state. You have to elect him by mutual consultation. Amrahum shura bainahum. Now this authority that you have as a vote, for example, I can say, this is the biggest trust of the community 
and of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your hand. Now, if you are giving this word to a person who is not worthy of it, so you are making khayana. You are not proving to be a means. So actually, all these, these things, whatever offices, whatever responsibilities are to be given to the people to manage the affairs of the community, of the ummah. So they, these things should be given, the offices, the responsibilities, these are the trust with you, and you have to hand them over to people who are worthy of it. Inna Allah ya murukum an tuaddul amanati lahleha. Who are, who have the capability of making ishtihad? Who can be entrusted with the process of legislation in the Islamic State? You have to select them, or elect them whatsoever it is. And who is going to be the head of the state? You have to elect him, or select him. But you know this, this, your opinion that you give, the vote that you give, that is the biggest trust. And you have to use it for the persons who have the capability and who are worthy of it. Now the second institution, and that is judiciary. And when you are judging between the people, any dispute, any affair which has erupted, and you sit in judgment, whosoever you are, whenever you are judging, between the people, among the people, you must judge with justice, not no partisanship, no favors, special favors to anybody. You have to, to cling to the justice principles of Adl and Kist. Inna Allah ni'imma ya'idhukum bi. These are very excellent teachings and advices that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Because on this is based the structure of, this, of the state. And what is state, by the way? When a society reaches a mature organization state, stage, it becomes a state. As I told you, what is society? It's a collection of families. Now an organized society becomes a state. And now you have to manage the affairs of that state. And you have to have some legislature. You have to have some, some judiciary. These are the two essential ingredients of that state. Inna Allah yamurukum an tuaddul amanati ilahliha. Number one. Number two, wa idha hakam tu bain an nas, an tahkumu bil abdi. Inna Allah ni'imma yu'idukum bi. These are the best advices, most excellent teaching that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you. إِنَّهُ كَانَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ سَمِيعًا بَسِيرًا Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever listening, ever seeing. Now comes the second ayah. And this is rather more profound. This is discussing the executive, the executive head. You may call him caliph, head of the state. Here in United States you have the president and so on. Or in the parliamentary system, it's the prime minister, so on. Whosoever is there. Now, what is the sequence of obedience in Islamic State? Who are to be obeyed? Ya yuhalladzina amanu ati'u allaha wa ati'u rasoola wa ulil amre minkum. O you who believe, or O you who profess to believe, who claim to believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger. And those who are placed in position of authority from amongst you. Now there are three, Allah, Rasul, and Ulul Amr Minkum. Now see how beautifully a differentiation has been made. The verb Ati'u has been repeated twice, but not with the third. There could be two other forms. Atiyu could be taken out, out of the bracket, as a common factor. Atiyullah wa rasoola wa ulil amri minkum. Not to repeat again. Atiyullah wa rasoola wa ulil amri minkum. Within the bracket, all the values are multiplied by the, the value which is outside the bracket. Or, it could be repeated all the three times. Atiyullah wa atiyu rasoola wa atiyu ulil amri minkum. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has discarded these two modes of expression. 
and he has taken atiullah wa atiur rasul wa ulil amri bilkum what does it mean the itah the obedience to allah and messenger is absolute and permanent unconditional you have to obey them anyhow these are the two basic sources of islamic law fundamental sources of the islamic law kitab and sunnah as we call it the book of allah that is in place of allah now and number two the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that is in place of rasul atiullah wa atiur rasul and these two are fundamental and these are permanent you can't question the authority of allah and you can't question the authority of the messenger you can't have a dispute or a difference of opinion with allah and in the same way you can't have a dispute or a difference of opinion from muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but for the third this verb atiyu has not been repeated there is some basic difference wa ulil amr minkum and also you obey the ulil amr who have been placed in authority now how have they been placed in authority that is given in the first ayah inna allah ya'murukum an tuaddu amanati ila ahliha you select them you elect them but you know you should be honest and sincere you should give these positions of authority to those only who are worthy of it who are capable to deliver, deliver the goods not to your relatives not to your tribesmen not to, to somebody who can do some personal favor to you no this is dishonesty in sincerity to allah and the islamic state so you have to give this amana to the people to the persons who are capable of holding it this position now when they are in the position now you have placed them in authority you have selected abu bakr as khalifa he was not appointed by allah subhanahu wa taala nor he was nominated by muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it was by mutual consultations that the companions of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they they selected him so actually now this is not mamur bin allah previously the prophet who was mamur bin allah he was the caliph you had to accept him anyhow but now that institution of prophethood has come to an end in the person of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam after him no one is mamur bin allah no one can claim to be appointed by allah subhanahu wa taala everyone you know derives his mandate or authority from the people from the community because they have elected him they have selected him but now from them you can disagree number one they must be muslims ulul amr minkum what does it mean muslims can never accept from their hearts at least that they be governed by non muslims well if they are compelled if they have been captured if they have been conquered if they have been rendered helpless it's something else but a muslim can never accept from the depths of the heart the authority of a non muslim ulul amr minkum he has to be from amongst you he has to be muslim not only the head of the state has to be muslim the legislators also can be only from muslims no non muslim can join the legislature of an islamic state because the sources of the legislation are the book of allah and the sunnah of the prophet he believes in neither of them so how can he be associated with the process of legislation and ijtihad the process of legislation now in the modern islamic state will be ijtihad how can a non muslim be assigned this responsibility of ijtihad and legislating and, and deriving and inferring from the book of allah and the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he doesn't believe in them so they have to be minkum if you take this american system the the congressman and your senator they have to be muslim if this is it is become the islamic state may allah do it then you know only muslims head of the state muslim president has to be muslim no non muslim can be associated non muslims will remain in an islamic state a protected minority they will remain a protected minority they will not be equal citizens to the muslims in the islamic state this is a very bitter pill to swallow but we have to see to the reason to the principles this is the basic difference between islamic state and a secular state in a secular state religion is just irrelevant to this to the affairs of the state it's a private affair only 
You can be a Hindu, you can be a Muslim, you can be a, you can be a Jew, you can be something else, you can be a Buddhist, go to your synagogue, go to your mosque, go to your temple, go to anywhere you like, but regarding the affairs, the collective affairs of the community and the state, there will be no reference whatsoever to any religion, to any revealed law, to any revealed guidance, nothing of the sort. But Islamic State is based on Islam, it's based on the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So only those who believe in it can be assigned the offices and the positions of authority, and only they can be assigned the responsibility of legislation. But now there can be a difference of opinion. Everybody had the right to differ from Abu Bakr ta'ala. Everybody, every Muslim had, had the right to differ from Umar ta'ala. Because Umar was not the prophet of Allah. He was not infallible. Abu Bakr was not a messenger of Allah. He was not infallible. And you know there was a difference of opinion regarding the lands which were captured by the Muslims. The big, big lands, big countries, Syria and Iraq and Iran and Egypt. Now some of the, some of the uh, fellow Muslims, you know, and the companions of the Prophet, وسلم, they demanded that this is mal ghanima this is booty. Now divide it amongst us. You can keep only one-fifth to the state. For the state, one-fifth. And the four-fifths have to be distributed among people who were, who were fighting in the field. Hazrat Umar said, no. This is not mal ghanima This is mal fe And this will go totally to the battle mal of the Muslims, collective. They will be owned collectively by the Muslim Ummah, not distributed. This would have become the, the biggest feudal system of human history, you know, a few thousand people. They conquered all these countries. This was the ishtihad of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala. But you know, there was a different opinion. The matter was discussed. A special committee was assigned. Five Sahaba from Aus, the tribe of Aus, and five from the tribe of Khadraj. They were formed into a committee. And then you, they consulted. And then they approved that ishtihad of Umar radiallahu ta'ala is correct. And that it was the consensus of the Muslims now. This, that is why there is a this differentiation of lands. This is Ushri, this is Kharaji. If a Muslim owns a land, piece of land, a farm, then it is Ushri. Only one-tenth or one-twentieth of the produce will be taken. Ushri. But if it is Kharaji, it is the collective property of the Muslim Ummah. It is not the personal property of any Muslim individual. Then you know, maybe 50%. Now they are tenants. Whosoever are, are working over there, they are tenants. They are not owners of that field or, or that farm or that piece of land. And they will pay even 50%. Rawal will go straight. Kharaj, it is called Kharaj, not Ushri. So this is an example I gave you. If there can, if there is some difference of opinion between you and the people who are at the helm of affairs, what to do then? Where to go? If I am differing from the opinion of Abu Bakr, what to do now? He says, I have deduced this from Quran and Sunnah. I say, no, I differ from your opinion. I deduce in this way. My inference is this. Now, فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ Now, here, a common citizen of the Islamic State and the head of that state, they are at par. The decision will be given by Allah and His Messenger. Because only the obedience to Allah and the Messenger was absolute. What does it mean? Now it has to be decided by the judiciary whether which opinion is more correct, more near the spirit of the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ If you really believe in Allah, and if you really believe in the last day, ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَحْسَنُ التَّعْوِيلَ This is the best way to conduct your state, affairs of the community and state, and this is going to produce the best results. In the end you will find this is the best way. Now because in the early days of caliphate, this judiciary was not present over there 
as a different and independent institution. Let me tell you, first of all, during the days of the Prophet ﷺ, he was the caliph. He was heading all the, not only three institutions, but all the four institutions of the state. He was the head of the state, he was the caliph. If Hazrat Dawood was caliph, was not Muhammad Sallallahu the caliph of Allah? He was the caliph. Because the commands of Allah were coming to him. Then he was the legislator. That is why we call him Shari alayhi salam. He had to interpret. He had to interpret the wahi which is coming to him from Allah. And he had to make new fresh judgments. Then he was the chief justice also. All these matters and disputes had to be settled by him. And he was the commander-in-chief also. All the four, you know, positions were held by whom? By Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But gradually, you know, these institutions, they got separated from each other. In the days of Hazrat Ali, we know that judiciary became independent. Because Hazrat Ali, radiallahu ta'ala, filed a suit in the court of Qadi Shureh. And you know, his, his case was dismissed because he could not produce any witnesses to his claim, except the son and the slave. And Qadi Shura said, no, although we can't say that you are telling a lie, but it's a law. All Muslims are equal in the eyes of law. Here you are, not as the caliph of the state, here you are appearing as a Muslim, a citizen. Judiciary is higher up. And here you know, whosoever is judging, is a hakam tum nas and tahkumu biladl. Now because the witness, the testimony of a son or a slave who is owned by the person, it is not acceptable. If you have another another witnesses, produce them. And Hazrat Ali said, no, I don't have any other witnesses. Okay. Your case dismissed. And it was against the Jew. And the Jew accepted Islam saying this, you know, that this is the condition of the state. The head of the state, his claim can be dismissed in the state. So he became a Muslim. But you know, these institutions now today, by the process of social evolution, and let us do justice to others also. We owe this to the Western nations. They have developed these institutions of the state. We Muslims gave them the light from the universities of Cordova and Granada and Toledo. We passed the torch of knowledge and light to them. And then we went to sleep. These people worked. The scientific development took place there. This electricity was not invented by any Muslim. But we are using it. This loudspeaker, these cameras, not invented by any Muslim. We are using them. In the same way, these institutions, they have developed. In principle, essentially all these things were given by the Muslims. These all things were given by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to humanity at large. As Allama Iqbal says, Har koja bini jahane rangobu, aake az khakash bero ye darzu, ya ze nure mustafa ura bahast, ya hunuz andar talash e mustafaast. Wherever you find something good, something noble, from which, you know, the seed of desire, you know, it, it, it grows up, you will see, Either this light has been borrowed from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or man is still proceeding and trying to reach where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had taken the humanity 1400 years ago. So this judiciary now, now you know, there's the Congress, legislation, vested with them. Here's the executive. The president is the executive head. The executive machinery is under him. And here's the judiciary. And here's the constitution. If the executive head or the executive machinery is doing something wrong, you go and knock the door of the judiciary, the superior courts. So this is the system that has evolved in the West. And let me say here, at the highest level of evolution today stands the American constitutional system. The British parliamentary system lags much behind. There's duplicity. Head of the state is someone else. Head of the government is someone else. How can the powers be balanced between the two? 
head of the state there, the king or the queen is just nominal, symbolic, nothing to do with the affairs of the state. All the authority is in the hands of the prime minister. But if we imitate their, and we are imitating their example, what happens? In Pakistan, either the head of the state is rendered to, this, to the position of Chaudhary Fadli Elahi. And then people have to demand he must be released from the presidential palace. So he is in prison over there. Or, you know, the president becomes the Aul Haq. Or, uh, who was this fellow? Ishaq Khan. He can dismiss the prime minister, elected prime minister, and just send him home. There can be no balance. And this is shirk. The authority at the head, at the top, should be held by one person. The same person, head of the state and head of the government. This is Tawheed. And actually they have gone there. Only if they had, I have been saying it in my long lectures regarding the political system of Islam, if to this constitution of United States you add only three things, it becomes caliphate, Islamic caliphate. You add the objective resolution as we have in Pakistan, but there it is only theoretical, not practical. The sovereignty belongs to Allah. This should be the clause one. Clause two, no legislation can be done here at any level. Repugnant to the Quran and the Sunnah. Absolute obedience to the two. And number three, full citizenship of the state is held only by the Muslims. The non-Muslims, they are protected minority. Their lives, their honor, their belongings, they will be protected. They will have free hand in their personal law, in marriages, etc., etc., inheritance. They will be free to practice any religion they would like. But they will not be associated in the process of legislation, number one, and at the highest level of policy decisions. These, they are barred from that. If you add these three things, it becomes the most advanced khilafa on earth. But each one pill of this, you know, is very bitter to swallow. We have not been able to swallow it up till now in Pakistan. So what to speak of the United States of America? But we have to work towards that end. Now, after these two ayat, we proceed further. And as I told you in the beginning, yesterday, that a very big chunk of this Surah Nisa, it deals the affairs of the Munafiqun, without naming them. In the end, they will be named also. But in the beginning, you know, what we call Ruwe Sakhun, although they are not mentioned. But actually, these ayat are discussing the problems that were created or who were being faced by the Munafiqeen themselves. But let us first of all know, who is the Munafiq? Who were the Munafiqeen of Medina at that time? There were certain people in Medina who accepted Islam. But they accepted not by thoroughly understanding what they are accepting, what are the implications of accepting Islam. If you are accepting Islam, you have to be totally obedient to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you have accepted Islam, you have to accept it the whole divine law. If you have accepted Islam, you will have to sacrifice your lives and belongings and money for the cause of Allah, for jihad in the way of Allah. These are the implications of accepting Islam. People who understood it, those who accepted it at the face value, there was no problem with them. When they have decided in Allah, We have already sold ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this life doesn't belong to me. It's a sacred trust of Allah with me. Whenever He demands, I'll just give and lay down my life. Now all that I possess is not my property. I have sold it to Allah, already sold. In Allah al Now this is I'm only a custodian. Whenever Allah demands, I'll present it. Now there's no problem for them. But there were people who accepted Islam only because the whole clan or family of the tribe has accepted. So why to remain separate? Go ahead, 
you also accept Islam, embrace Islam. Or in an only emotional way, something strikes to you, oh, it's good, I must have it. But you are not looking to the implications. What does it mean? What you will have to do after this? But in that, you know, a flooding of emotion, you have accepted it. But now when the implications come, they waver, they tremble, they start, you know, they are oscillating now. Muzab zabina bayna zalik, la ilaha ulai wa la ilaha ulai. Ima mujhe roke hai to khenche hai mujhe kufr. Kaaba mere piche hai, kalisa mere aage. What should I do? I have become Muslim. Well, I now I am required to go to fight in the way of Allah, risking my life. Oh, it's not an easy job. Every day the Prophet is saying, Anfiqu fi sabilillah, anfiqu fi sabilillah, anfiqu fi sabilillah. Oh, but this wealth is very dear to me. I can't part with it. Now what to do? So there were certain problems for them. And these peoples were oscillating between kufr and iman. We shall find, you know, this ayah, very beautiful ayah, in the later sections of this very surah. In the amanu, summa kafaru. Summa amanu, summa kafaru. They were oscillating between iman and kufr. Going two steps toward iman, and then four steps this word. So that there are two steps towards kufr. Now they are oscillating between kufr and iman. Muzab zabina bayna zalik, la ilaha ulai, la ilaha ulai. They were the munafits. But still this disease, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also calls it a maraz. Fi qulubihim maradun, fazadahum allahu marada. This is a disease. This disease was progressing gradually. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the beginning he is not naming them, not pointingly, you know, bringing them to the eyes of the society. But the problems, they are discussed here. Later it will be made clear who are they. But Sharil Munafiqina Bianna Lahum in Allah Azab al Hafima. Now give these glad tidings to these Munafiqeen. These Munafiqeen, glad tidings. That for them there is a very painful chastisement. But that will come in the later sections. Here. Now identify please three problems, main problems. The first problem for these Munafiqeen was. How come we have to obey Muhammad in every matter? It's not an easy job. Like I can't sacrifice my ego. Who's he? He's also a human being. In every matter I have to obey him. Number two. Going to Qatar. Hard. Not ready. Number three, and this was not for the munafiqeen of Medina, this was for the munafiqeen elsewhere. When you know hijra was made compulsory, because now after hijra, because the Prophet had to take an initiative, a final offensive against kufr, because the center of kufr was Makkah at that time. Now we had to have the offensive, initiative. And for that purpose it was necessary that all the Muslims from all tribes, from every hook and corner of Arabia, they should converge at one point, so that the whole force is there available for the advance now. So this was, it was made imperative, compulsory. You have to migrate, you have to immigrate to Medina. Now people who were at Mecca, for some of them it became very hard to leave their homes, families. They had accepted Islam, but they were not ready to part from their families and tribes. And that was also the case of other people from other tribes. They were scattered to breadth and length and, you know, of, of the Arabian Peninsula. Now to leave their families, to leave their tribes, to leave the land of their ancestors, where, you know, their ancestors were being buried. How can I leave? How can I go? So that was the third problem. So these three problems will be discussed, discussed now in the coming ayat. Let us hastily finish the first. Alam tara ila al-lazina yaz'amuna annahum amanu bima unzila ilayka wa ma unzila bin tablik. Have you not considered, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the case of those? Yaz'amun, who think? 
who claim annahum amanu bima unzila ilayka that they have believed come to believe in whatever has been sent down to you o muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam ta unzila min qablik and also the books that were sent before now who they claim to be muslims when they are claiming that we believe in what has been revealed to you o muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam they have become muslims but what are they doing yuriduna an yatahakamu ila taghut they want to get the judgments of their disputes not from muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but from taghut they want to go to the courts of the jews and i told you yesterday madina was still you know a mixed society three tribes of jews were there then all you know also khazraj people had not embraced islam there were still you people who who had not embraced islam or declared themselves to be muslims so there then there were the kahins and the sorcerers now a person says i am a muslim but he takes his case his dispute to be decided by a jew or to be to, to, he wants to take the judgment from some kahin what does it mean he is not acting according to his faith he should come to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam for all the disputes to be settled by him he is the head of the state i told you he is the chief justice yuridun an yatahakamu ila taghut and what is taghut please understand what is taghut i explained last night also tagha to exceed the limits we say in urdu darya tughyani par hai when you know the river is flooding it is overflowing its banks that we call tughyani now for human beings the limits are the limitations placed by allah subhanahu wa taala anybody who is crossing the limits man yatadda hudud allah he becomes a taghut he is in tughyani he has crossed his limits he has crossed the limits of the sharia he becomes taghut only a person or an institution or a society or a state which acts upon ya ayyuhal ladina amanu atiu allah wa atiu rasula wa lil amri minkum this is the only exception every other society every other institution every other form of state is taghut and they want to go to taghut to get their cases and disputes decided alam tara yal ladina yad'umun annahum amanu bima unzila ilayka wa ma unzila min qablik yuridun an yatahakamu ila taghut wa qad umiru an yakfuru bi and they have been ordered that they must deny and refute taghut not to acknowledge them not to accept them not to get your decision your your disputes decided by them wa yuri wa yuridu shaitan an yudillahum dalalan ba'ida but satan this iblis he is bent upon taking these people astray and these people these munafiqeen who want their cases to be decided not by muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but by someone else they are actually they are the they are the friends of shaitan they are following shaitan waiza qila lahum and when it is said to them taala ila ma azra allah wa ila rasul now must be some brothers some muslims some true mu'min he would have he must have said where are you going to get the decision to get the judgment you profess to be a muslim why don't you come to the divine law ila ma anzala allah allah subhanahu wa taala has given us the law and we have muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam among us wa iza qila lahum ta'alu ila ma anzala allah wa ila rasul ra'ayta al munafiqin yasudduna anka sududa you will see that these munafiqin they hold back from you they refrain from you they don't want to come to you o muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam because there is disease in their hearts and that disease is the disease of difa fa kayfa idha asabatun musibatun what will happen if some infliction comes to them some affliction something unpleasant befalls them due to their wrong attitude bima qaddamat aydihim due to whatever their hands have earned summa jauka yahlifuna billah then they will return to you and they will swear by allah subhanahu wa taala in aradna illa ihsanan wa tawfiqa if we went there you know o oh prophet o oh messenger of allah our intentions were not wrong we only wanted reconciliation we only wanted something which is good 
and a reconciliation. We were not going there for any bad intentions. They are the people. Allah very well knows what is in their hearts. Far is on whom? So Prophet ﷺ just ignore them. Why? It's not yet time to engage with them. Because you have yet to consolidate your own position at Medina. The authority and the jurisdiction of Islamic State has not been established fully up till now. So just ignore them. Don't try to punish them. Don't bring them to book. Just ignore them. Far is on whom is whom. But admonish them. Teach them. Give them advice. وَقُلْ لَهُمْ فِي أَنفُسَهِمْ قَوْلٌ بَلِيغًا And say to them such words which penetrate into their hearts. This can have two meanings. Some advice which penetrates into your heart. قَوْلِ بَلِيغٍ And something which very well warns them that their attitude is wrong. Although the words, you know, used by the Prophet ﷺ are very soft. But they can know what it means. قَوْلًا بَلِيغًا وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُتَعَ بِاسْمِ اللَّهِ This is the principle. And we have never sent any messenger except to be obeyed by the command of Allah. If you have accepted Muhammad as messenger of Allah, you have to obey him anyhow. You can't refuse. He is the messenger of Allah. This is a very beautiful ayah in Surah Maryam. Hazrat Ibrahim said to his father, Ya abate inni qad jaani min al-ilm ma lam yatik fattabeni ahdeka siratan samiyya. Oh my dear father, to me a knowledge has come which didn't come to you. So you have to follow me. I will lead to you, lead you to the right path. Now a son saying to the father. But the reason is, why he has come to me, not to you. Ya abate inni qad jaani min al-ilm ma lam yatik fattabeni ahdeka siratan samiyya. So whomsoever you accept as messenger of Allah, you have to obey him. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ إِذْزَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاوُوكَ وَاسْتَغْفَرُوا اللَّهِ And if, when they had committed some sin, had they come to you, O Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا اللَّهِ And they would have themselves asked the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمُ الرَّسُولِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the Prophet and the Messenger would have also asked the forgiveness of Allah for them. لَوَجَدُ اللَّهَ تَوَّابَ الرَّحِيمًا They would have found Allah to be tawwab and raheem. He is the acceptor of tawbah. Always ready to accept tawbah. Waiting for his servant to make tawbah and return to him. And if he returns, he also returns with mercy. As I explained yesterday, last night. You know, tawbah is both sides. Tawwab, Allah is tawwab, and the bald man is also tawwab. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجْرَ بَيْنَهُمْ Now this is the final verdict. So no, and by your Lord, لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ They will never be accepted as true moments. حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ Unless they make you the judge. فِي مَا شَجْرَ بَيْنَهُمْ In all the affairs, disputes which arise between them. ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ أَحَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتِ And then the decision and verdict that you give, they don't find in their hearts any displeasure. Although they have accepted, but even if there is a displeasure in the hearts, true iman is not there. This is the level of obedience. وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا And then they have to, to submit with total submission. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجَدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتَ وَيُسُلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Now because the time is over for this first session, I'm sorry, but you know, this subject will be continued in the second section. الله أكبر The Islamic Organization of North America, IONA, 
is an organization dedicated to reviving the Quran into the hearts of Muslims while bringing its message to non-Muslims. The obligations of a Muslim as ordained by the Quran and Sunnah can be understood as having four levels. One, a Muslim is required to develop real faith and conviction, Iman, in one's heart. Two, a Muslim is required to live a life of complete submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Three, a Muslim is required to propagate and disseminate the message of Islam to humanity as a whole. Four, a Muslim is required to try his utmost in establishing the just Islamic order. The first and foremost objective of establishing Iona is to assist the Muslims in North America to uphold and implement these obligations first on themselves, their families, inform their friends, and then to invite the non-Muslims to Islam. The ultimate goal is to seek Allah's pleasure and salvation in the hereafter. For more information about Iona, please visit us at www.tanzim.us. You may also email us at info at tanzeem.us or call our toll-free number 866-779-IONA. Join us. Together we can make a difference.